You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Hello, I want to welcome you back to Proof Text. I'm Fred Long and we are in Grammar Point episode uh, 39. And we're looking and returning back to the article. Uh, we're in part four. This is part four of the article, uh, Discourse Pragmatics 2. We're talking about the pragmatic use of the article and its significance. It's always good to review the article ending. So here they are. A, tes, te, tain. Feminine, right? Plural is e, ton, tes, tas. Masculine are o, tu, to, ton. E tone tis tus, and then the neuter singular are to 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 to. <laughs> Three of those sound the same, right? And then the plural are ta tone tis ta. So the singular is to, um, and that's going to be nominative or accusative. To uh, so tav omicron, and then you have the genitive to. And then we have the dative with uh, an omega and iota subscript as to. All right. So last time we were looking at some of the principles uh, of, of uh, activation of participants and entities into the discourse. So when you basically the rule is um, if you introduce someone new into the discourse, you do so without the article. That is, they are anarthrous. When they are referred back to again, they typically have the article because they're a known entity. So basically, when an article is present, it's it's indicating a known or already introduced entity into the discourse. Now, there is a an important kind of principle as well that when you, uh, this is listed here under D, we're looking at, um, my Koine Greek Grammar, chapter 21.4, the discourse pragmatic use of the article or its absence. So um, on page 417, at the bottom of the page, there's a paragraph describing general nouns. And this is a principle here. I'm quoting, the introduction of a place, space, or situation will also assume the items persons commonly understood as present therein. So therefore, when explicitly mentioned, such items, persons, will generally be articular, even though it is their first mention. Okay, so what this means is that uh, they're known because of the setting or situation that's been introduced or, or is just known to the audience. So remember, the article indicates something known, something known either assumed from the audience's cognitive environment or entailed in some idea or setting or situation that's been mentioned in the discourse. Now, uh, I've been intrigued by this kind of principle, um, and and a lot of work has already been applied to uh, looking at the Gospels. And if you're looking at the video here, uh, I am on, in my Koine Greek Grammar, I, I summarize discussions by Levinson, Stephen Levinson on this, and I'm not going to read all that to you, but um, for those of you who are able to watch um, and look, you're seeing some discussions of that uh, there. So I'll just read, I guess, one. So uh, Levinson notes that in Matthew and Mark, once Jesus has been activated by an initial anarthrous reference in Mark 1, 9, in Matthew 1, 16, he then shows a global very important participant, VIP status, and is never again reactivated. So what that means is that he is uh, always going to have the article unless he's doing something important. So he shows a global VIP status and is never again reactivated except after his resurrection. So in Matthew 28, 9, he is reintroduced as a Narthris. But thereafter, 
uh, in the following verses of chapter 28, Jesus has the article. Okay, so pretty cool stuff. Um, in Luke 1 through 3, Jesus is always anarthrous. So I guess he's just that important, right? He's, he's already been activated. He's always anarthrous. But ac- after activation at the start of his ministry, so in other words, 4-1 in Luke, he's anarthrous. But then after that, Jesus achieves a global VIP status. So we then observe him being arthrous, uh, having the article thereafter, until his resurrection, after which then Jesus is reactivated by being an arthrous in 24-15, that is, without the article. This kind of stuff is really quite amazing. So you can see that summary there. I wanted to just take a moment and look at Ephesians, uh, the opening verses of Ephesians, just because there's some interesting article use, and I have them all highlighted here. So Ephesians 1, 1 through 8, and just take a few moments to reflect on what's going on here. So in verses 1 and 2, the only articles, so Jesus has mentioned, Paul has mentioned, um, God's mentioned multiple times, and Jesus a couple times, they never have the article. So um, that's rather interesting. In fact, the only thing that does have the article are the recipients of the letter. So to the saints, which are also faithful in Christ Jesus. So only the saints in Ephesus have the article. And obviously that's because they are known. <laughs> They're known to the audience because it's, it's them. So once we then get into verse 3, then we see that um, God has an article. God is known. And then the Lord Jesus has an article, although the appositional statement doesn't have the article. Um, So so this is kind of normal use. God has already been introduced. He has the article. So has the Lord Jesus. Uh, But then we have the heavenly realms have the article. So, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So, this just raises the question, why are these heavenly realms so uh, known? Why are they known, the heavenlies? And it may be because that's where God is, and maybe that that reality is, of course, known because this is where God is residing and, and, and Christ is residing. This is an important theme in Ephesians because Christ is going to be seated, um, seated in the heavenly realms. So this is a known, this is a known um, space in Ephesians. And I might say it's maybe even a populated, uh, contested space because other things are there, but Jesus is put far above them in the upper heavenly space. But, um, okay, so then we're looking at further uses of the article. In verse 5, we have new articles. Um, so we have a lot of ideas without articles. Creation of the world. These are uh, in love, uh, adoption. But then we, we have... Um, we have, uh, he's foreordained us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the good good pleasure of his, the will. So the will of him. So here, good pleasure and will are articular and they haven't been introduced yet, except they probably are entailed with the idea of God choosing and deciding ahead of, ahead of time things. So the idea of a good pleasure and God's will are known because of the they're entailed. They're entailed already in some ideas of God's uh, foreordaining and choosing ahead of time. So once you have those ideas introduced, it's not going to be far removed than that his will is a definite thing and his good pleasure is a definite thing. Uh, Then we do have his grace. Grace is articular. But we have had a reference to grace earlier 
grace and peace to you. So it could be that that grace is referring back there, or it could be that this grace is understood again as entailed in God's good pleasure and will, which is entailed in his choosing and foreordaining. So at this point, we may have uh, kind of ideas kind of piled up here that are entailed in one another. What's also important to see is that this grace is, is really focused on and stressed. His grace, which he graced us. Um, and then he's actually going to return to the grace in verse 7, which is also abounded to us. So there's a lot of focus on the grace, the grace, the favor, the favor. Um, okay, and then just a couple other instances before we end this episode. Uh, we do have uh, Jesus known as the beloved one, the beloved one in the one having been beloved. But again, Jesus is a known person. So we've received grace. He's He's given us favor in the one having been beloved that is in Jesus in whom we have. And then we have articular the redemption through the blood of him, the forgiveness of the trespasses. Okay, so each of those has an article. And so I'm wondering why there is an article with the redemption. And it might be that the redemption, we have the redemption through the having been beloved one. And this is intriguing to me because, you know, when Jesus was baptized, he was baptized as the beloved one, a cognate of this participle form, agapitos, and that that calling as a beloved one is a sacrificial idea. Um, it, it harkens back to Genesis 22, where Abraham was sacrificing Isaac, and three times in Septuagint, it's translated as the beloved one, the beloved one, the beloved one. And I think that at Jesus' baptism and transfiguration, and also in the parable of the tenants needing to hand over the beloved one to kill him, so they can take over the vineyard, that there is an understanding of death and blood and sacrifice, uh, redemption. So that's why I think this idea of the redemption through his blood, that is the forgiveness of the sins, I think that's why those are all um, articular, is I think they're entailed and Jesus' identity as the beloved one. All right, well, that's all we have time for today. I hope you found this helpful to think a little bit more about the discourse, pragmatic use of the article. And by the way, this is work that needs to be done and thought through, and I think it has implications for interpretation and understanding what the early Christian communities understood and knew and what, they, what ideas they entailed together. Well, anyway, thanks for listening and watching. Hope to have you listen. Watch us next time. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glossa House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.